you are seen. You are worthy. You are not alone. The world loses one person to suicide every 40 seconds. Let's change the stats. Together, we can say not suicide. Not today. Trauma. It is something that has touched all of our lives in some way. In a lot of cases, that trauma comes by some form of abuse. We go on in life, sometimes thinking that we are alone in this abuse and that we can never heal. If somebody was to tell you that they have not only been through it, but have found a way to heal, would you listen? Would you believe them? Join me as I talk to my extraordinary person, D. Hurley, on this episode of True Crime, Authors and Extraordinary People. Welcome to True Crime, Authors and Extraordinary People, the podcast where we bring two passions together, the show that gives new meaning to the old adage, truth is stranger than fiction, and reminding you that there is an extraordinary person in all of us. Here is your host, David McClam. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to an episode of True Crime, Authors and Extraordinary People. Of course, I'm your man, David McClam. Hey, if you guys haven't already, make sure you follow us on all of our social medias. One link to a link tree will get you to every link you need to have pertaining to the show. Well, it is time once again for an extraordinary person. And we all need a little healing in our lives. So I think I have the proper guest just for that. Let me tell you a little bit about who our guest is. She is a member of several domestic abuse advocacy groups to help bring awareness to family court corruption. She used energy healing to heal PTSD and other physical ailments she received during an 11 and a half year narcissistic abusive marriage. She found a wonderful energy healing device that helps heal PTSD and so many other things. And she believes that energy is everything. We are energy bodies and need to be in the right frequencies for optimal health. She is the owner of Lighthouse Energy and advocate and my extraordinary person. Please welcome D. Hurley. Hey, D. how you doing? Thank you. You have such a voice for this. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I hear that all the time. To me, it's just normal. I hear myself talk all day. <laughs> well, thank you for coming on the show. It is my honor and pleasure to have you here today. Thank you for having me. This is wonderful. So there's a number of topics that we can uh, talk about. But before we do, let's start off with this. Is there anything else that we don't know about D. Hurley that was not in your introduction? Well, that's... The biggest part, that's the most important part, I think, is just those life experiences that led to this. And and now I'm just trying to share it with everyone. I want everyone to know that they can heal. So you are a big advocate to bring awareness to family court corruption. Let's talk about that for a minute. When you say family court corruption, can you tell me the audience exactly what you mean by that? I mean, you have to follow the money with everything. And whenever you have a high conflict custody case, they make so much money off of those. So they it pays them to keep the the problems coming up. These attorneys make so much money in the courts whenever there's especially when there's like abuse charges or something like that. And what we've noticed with some of the advocacy groups is there are ties to child trafficking and stuff that's coming out. And I know I can't say too much about that because some people have been um, threatened for talking wow. about some of the things they've uncovered with family courts. But yes, it definitely feeds the system to keep the criminal activity going or the abuse of children. Because, of course, they'll wind up back in that situation, most likely in the system. And um, yeah, it's I didn't know how bad it was until I went through it myself. And now I've you wouldn't believe the horrific stories that I've heard along the way. And I'm like, well, I believe it now after all I've seen in the last six years. I'm glad that you're out there fighting for that because I have yelled and screamed about this for years. Uh, I've seen it, you know, judges, some of them are crooked in many other ways too, but I just got through watching something about that where a lady was being railroaded for her child. And it turns out the, the attorney that was fighting for her husband and the judge was in cahoots 
and there was money being paid out and nothing was wrong with the mom, right? The dad had the issues, but you're right. Wherever the money is, is where people go. Uh, LA County is where I'm from. I don't know if you're familiar with the Gabriel Fernandez case, but I feel like that was the biggest blunder uh, because a lot of those people got away with that. And I do feel like at some point, maybe some things was greased because of the way they did the investigation. Uh, so now that you've dug into this and you see how bad that it is, what made you decide to just pick up that torch and run with it and fight for it? I think because when I saw what it was doing to my kids, like they didn't need this extra stress and what was happening to them. You know, it was just a divorce. There's no reason to drag this out for six years and keep torturing the children and go through this. And I thought there's something wrong here. This is just not right to keep this litigation abuse, you know, going on and on and on when I'm just trying to get away from somebody who was toxic and hurting me and my children. You know, you think that it's just going to be clear cut. You know, he was being investigated by CPS. He had hurt our son. Our son spoke up about it. And, you know, you just think that you're going to get the right thing. You're going to get justice when you go to court. And that's not what it's like. <laughs> it's like I had all new traumas just from going through that system and had to do my healing process all over again. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah, unfortunately, in a lot of these cases, one parent or the next uses the kids as pawns. It draws off forever. Yep. I've went through this, not personally, but I had a friend whose husband finally he ended up committing suicide over it because it was seven years. And it's like, I'm never going to get anywhere. So I'm glad that you are out there fighting for that. And I'm trying to be a voice for that as well. And hopefully together and with the audience here listening, we all joining together, we can put an end to this. Yes. And it's not just like something that happens to a woman. This happens to men too. It's, it's across the board. It's wherever they can make the most money. And if somebody is using the courts to hurt the other parent, they just keep feeding it. It's ridiculous. And yeah, I've, I have attended a picket in LA. I know LA is bad. Stanislaus County is awful. Fresno is awful. I've had, had known two women in our advocacy group who, um, they committed suicide too because of all this. And a lot was talking to all of us and hearing what we've been through. And I think people need to be very careful when they're going through this, that they are getting the healing work along the way, because it's scary when you're going through this system and you don't have any answers and you're just trying to protect your kids. It's a scary position to be in if you don't have a support system. These judges need to be held accountable. They need to be um, educated to recognize narcissistic abuse or litigation abuse. And the mediators need to be trained better. Because they could stop a lot of this. It's not right that our children should have to suffer for this and go through years and years of trauma trying to get peace in their life. But it turns out to be just the opposite. Now, fortunately, you got to that point and now to where you're doing now because you were in a relationship for 11 and a half years with a narcissistic husband. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that, what you went through and how you got out of that? There were a lot of red flags and I just ignored the red flags. And that's going to be a, that is a section in my book about looking for the red flags and believing people when they first show you who they are. You know, um, I was just raised when those people just, you know, trying to believe the best in people and always look for the best in people. And that can get you hurt sometimes if you're not looking at everything, the whole picture that's right in front of your face. You know, I should have believed the first things that were told to me and some of the warning signs. The very day we got married, the day we got married, he threatened to run the car off the road with my three-year-old daughter in the backseat. And I should have jumped right then, but I was in a typical situation where I was away from home. He had brought me to California away from all of my family, all of my connections. And I had just sold everything in my home just started over. I had a good paying job at a bank. I was doing pretty well. And then he came to my life and then, you know, we moved to California and started over and I just kind of felt, um, I don't vulnerable, I guess when I got here and it was just him and my three-year-old and I felt like I needed to make this work, you know, especially cause I had a three-year-old from a previous marriage, but, um, things just got worse. The anger, the rage, punching holes, throwing things at me and just the control stuff. You know, everything was controlled, the money, um, who I could talk to, you know, my friends were always turned against me the whole time. I try to make friends and I'd find out he'd say something behind my back or they would leave and he would tell me something bad about them. And I, you know, it, it was just, 
it was a struggle the whole time. And I kept trying to make it better. But when I saw that he focused his attention on our son and was having issues with him and threatened to kill him, he choked our son. That was when I said, that's it. I'm done. I'm out. You don't hurt my kids. You know, there he was young and I just wasn't going to tolerate that. And it's sad that it took that long, but <laughs> it's finally what gave me the strength. I had tried to leave three different times, but that was the final straw. And I really thought I was going to be able to protect them. And then I went through the whole court thing and I was like, wow, <laughs> they, they don't even really care that I'm trying to protect my children. They they don't even look at that. It's not really about the kids. It's about who has the most money, who's going to play the game and get you in there. I mean, I think in the last six years, I've been to court almost every other month, average. I'm like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> And he was calling suicide hotlines in the beginning. And I thought I was afraid for my kids to be around somebody like that. And I, I kept them for a couple of weeks until we had a court order that was used against me in court. They automatically said I was alienating him. And that's a term that's used wrongly a lot of times. You use that word. It's almost like you automatically get the kids parental alienation. But a lot of times this is flipped <laughs> and it's used the other way. And there are other, there are some advocacy groups that are trying to get that term out of there. And there are some states that do not use it anymore because it was a term that was created by Richard Gardner, who, if you read his book, a lot of his term is, is used to help protect fathers who want to have sex with their children. I don't know if I can speak about that here, but... You certainly can. It's more about pedophilia. His whole reasoning for that was... Because kids would be afraid to go to their fathers, you know, or or mother, you know, mothers can do this too. But it was mostly about protecting fathers and fathers' rights movements had taken off with this parental alienation. I'm being alienated. A lot of times, it's used against the safe parents, and then they lose their children. I think one of the craziest stories I heard since I've been in California was um, a lady here in Fresno County was trying to get away from a man she was dating. She was dating for a while. They lived together and she had a daughter from a previous marriage, full custody of her daughter. She found out that he was doing things to her daughter and she left. He took her to court to try to get custody of her daughter from a previous marriage. The judge gave him half custody. He made, he's forcing her to make her daughter go have visitations with this man, even though she brought it up and said, you know, what happened to her daughter and what she was afraid was going to continue happening. And she's like, I have no rights. I had to continue to take my daughter to somebody who was doing things to her. This, this is outrageous. And mothers are being faced with this. I'm not just moms, but a lot of them are being faced with this all the time. It's scary. Well, the one thing that I hope that is resonating with the audience, I've said this too, I've interviewed other people that has went through domestic violence situations. I'm a survivor of domestic violence from my father and from an ex-wife. And the, the theme that keeps resonating is control. And the first thing of that is isolation. I've got to get you away from the people that you know or that can help you because then you're out there on your own. The other thing too, yes, you can speak freely about anything here, especially pedophilia, because it's getting wildly out of hand. Like you said, this guy's wrote a book about it. There's been crime shows that has done shows on it. There's actually people that believe that this is a natural progression of how things should go. And there are some people that's advocating for it to be made legal. And yes. this is what the artists need to understand that our kids are not safe because we have people like this that feel like, hey, I get caught with a 12 year old kid, but it's OK because it should be more about the feeling and not the age. Forget the idea that this is a child who can't even make up their mind of what book to read tomorrow. But you right. want to do something that is very adult with them. So I'm glad that you do speak out on that. Yeah, they should be able to give people should be able to give consent. And, the, you know, this is ridiculous to be putting children in situations like this where they cannot protect themselves. And yeah, it is. I think this is the direction we're going and the poor system. I think they're very aware of it. And that's what's really sad. And we're trying to, with some of the groups, we're trying to expose some of the bad judges. There are lists you can look up online and find out what judges are involved in this and condone it and which judges will stand up. Just last year, there was a judge who tried to speak up about the family court corruption and she suicided herself. No surprise. <laughs> like, I feel sorry for the people trying to bring awareness to this. We've all been trying to be careful what we say. And these groups, 
a lot of people get nervous after a while and some of them do leave it, but we really need the support system. We need to speak out more and people need to be aware of what's going on. I 100% totally agree. But now from that, you get into, you know, I, I'm supposed you have to find ways to try to hear yourself. We know when it comes to domestic violence, that's not easy. Uh, those of us that's been through it, what people don't understand is we've went through, we go through long standing health issues because of the abuse and the violence and the mental strain. Yeah. I will ask you this. I've asked another lady this too, because my mother, when she was getting abused by my dad, same thing. Now, I don't know what your situation is, but my dad was the love of her life. First dude she was with had me at 21. You know, she thought he hung the moon. Uh, you and my mom and my wife is the same. You want to see the good in everybody. I used to be that way until I, <laughs> I, I said one day I said, Hey, I would love to, but unfortunately, especially doing the podcast, I do I'm like, I can't see the true, the, the, the good in everybody because there's some people that's just evil. How do you feel when you hear people say, well, he had to go to work sometime or you were alone with the kids taking him to school. So you could have just up and left. How do you feel about that? I just love it when people say that. <laughs> like, <laughs> they have no clue how hard it is to leave. And once you hear people's stories, you realize why people don't leave. Um, and I had tried for years and years, you know, and I talked to my mom, she's a psychologist too. And my mom was like, you got to get out. You got to get out. And I'm like, yeah, it's easier said than done. Where am I supposed to go? I've got three kids. He has the job. He has the career. I, I haven't even been working. I haven't even been allowed to go to school. All I've been doing is household things. And I don't know how to start over. And going through the divorce, I spent over $150,000 already. And it's still adding up. And I had to file bankruptcy at one point. Some of the moms are living in their cars because of the litigation abuse. Um, I have a really good friend here in town who has been wanting to leave an abusive situation, but after seeing what I'm going through, she's just sticking it out. And I don't know how much longer she's going to be around. It breaks my heart. But yeah, there's people that are in those situations. And I'll tell you, the healing process can be brutal. It's up and down. Um, I did get rid of the PTSD after the marriage. But going through the court, I got it again, <laughs> going through the court abuse. And I had to continue to do the healing work on myself. I mean, the neuropathy, the IBS, the anxiety, all the things that I suffered with during the marriage, I got and cleared up. And I'm not kidding, at least a month, under a month when I got out. A lot of it's just being around the toxic energy. And people who study energy, they know energy is real. And when you're around somebody who's narcissistic or abusive, I always would feel it in my stomach or my gut, I would get like this ball of pain in my stomach. And we need to listen to that. That's one of the first red flags. Listen to your gut. Whenever something's feeling off, when you're around somebody's energy field, you need to turn around because you need to listen to that voice. And I wish I would have have known that. I try to teach my daughter this now. Like just listen to your inner instincts about people when you're around them and you feel yucky, you need to go. But yeah, the, um, also retelling your story, it can be re-traumatizing because you know, like your brain doesn't know if it's the first time you're going through it or you're going through it again. So it's constantly doing the inner healing work. Um, yeah, I was glad that I got a hold of the book, The Emotion Code, and I started working on myself and my family. That's what helped me get rid of the PTSD. And that's what makes people like you strong. I, I say this all the time, too. You have to be in a place to keep repeating your story. And sometimes it, it's the same thing, but because of the way the questions are asked, depending on who you're talking to, it comes out differently. And people don't understand, I just interviewed a young lady named Amanda Blackwood, same thing, she was trafficked, didn't know it, three different times in her life, once at 39, uh, and writing her book, she wrote two books on it because it happened to her once, I think in Florida, and then again, internationally. Wow. So retelling that story to a psychologist, let alone having to write this down, you know, she's expressing this is hard because I got to relive it. And my mind takes me back to where that was. It's just things that we never forget at 50. Now there's things that happened to me at four and five that if I talk about them, I can see them because yeah. they're engraved in my head from now into the rest of time. Yep. So yeah, I relived that stuff sometimes just trying to write my book. There is some cathartic parts to it but you have to be in a good mental state when you start writing and you're ready to deal with it you're ready to talk about it just like today i've been preparing for hours like hey you're gonna do this you're gonna do fine you know <laughs> <laughs>
Well, hopefully it helps that you're with somebody that knows how you feel. I've been through it. And, you know, I tell everybody, when you ask me what I consider to be those dumb questions, why didn't your mom leave? Why did she go back? If you can walk in my shoes and see what she was going through and where she was at and all the control that was there, you would understand, especially from a woman's end, like you said, fear of money, fear of not having anything. I'm the opposite. I try to teach my wife and my daughters You've got to go out and have your own. Don't d- depend on the man. You know, I tell my wife all the time, she goes, well, you're the one that made some money. No, go get it. Do DoorDash, do something. But you have to be able to have money in case something happens to me or we split up, God forbid. But we've been married now 21 years. I don't think that's going to happen. I says, but I don't ever want you to be stuck in a situation where you have to depend on somebody else because you don't have anything. I teach that to my daughter now all the time. I tell her. I wish I would taught those lessons when I was little, you know, you, you have to be able to take care of yourself. And whenever you are in a stable place, that's a good time to, you know, maybe reach out and and find your soulmate. I don't know. (laughs) Just make sure that you can take care of yourself first. Don't depend on anyone else because you can really get stuck. So now that you went through all of that, you come out, now it's time to heal. How did you come about finding the company Lighthouse Energy? Well, I started that on my own. Um, a friend of mine had sent me a book called Divorcing a Narcissist. So I learned about Tina Swithin and then I learned what I was going through. I didn't even know what I was dealing with my whole marriage until I read that book. And I was like, she's been in my house. She knows my husband. And it just freaked me out. And then a little bit later, she's like, you got to read this book. It's called The Emotion Code. And I read that book and I was like, this is just a game changer. Like, why aren't we taught this in school? Why isn't everyone taught that we are energy bodies and that you can have emotions trapped in your body? And like, this is just blew my mind when I started reading that book. And I instantly knew that I needed to do that and start working on my kids. And I felt like there was a reason, you know, for all of those things happening, the divine timing, the doors just started opening and everything just started working out when I did make the choice to leave and get out. I could not believe how everything just started. It was a smooth path, finding the place to live. I had sent a text message, you know, trying to find a place to live and I couldn't find a place. And then um, somebody sent me a message. Um, you want to come look at the place this weekend? I'm like, what place? I never heard of it. I went there, I showed up and it was perfect for me. And then people were like, we really like you. We want you to take care of our home while we're gone. And I'm like, I still to this day do not know how they got my information, but there were just things, doors that just kept opening when I took that step and I knew that I was going in the right direction. And I've always loved lighthouses because I think there's like a beacon of light that you can look at when you're lost and you need to find your way. I've just always had a love for them. So I named the business Lighthouse Energy Healing when I started doing the healing work. And the people that started coming into my vibration and my space at that time were just it was a whole complete change. I lost the friends that I'd had before that were kind of moochers or people who kind of used me and the whole, like a whole different vibe of people came into my life. People who are high energy, they were successful, you know, and, and loving relationships, not just money, you know, they were just happy, high vibe people. So I saw really quickly how just changing your energy and getting the negative energies off of you can change your whole world, can change everything around you. So now, how did you come about, because you end up finding this wonderful device that helped you, how did you come about finding the AO scan device and how did that help out? Oh, you know, I, a friend of mine um, sent me a message about it on Instagram and I kept seeing this information about these bioresonance scanners. But um, one day I took a look at it and she did a scan on me and I just, I couldn't believe what showed up on this scanner. It's kind of like a lie detector test. You can um, speak. Yeah, it picks up messages or um, everybody has a, a voice signature. So it picks up whatever's going on in your voice and it'll tell you what's out of balance in your voice and it'll tell you what emotions are coming up either overused or underused. And then it will send you um, frequencies to help balance your body out. That just blew me away because it was kind of what I was doing with the emotion code and body code, but it was putting it in a tangible way because you could email them a report and they could see, oh, So this is what's coming up. This technology was used by NASA to keep the astronauts healthy in space. This technology has been around for a long time, but you know how things have a way of just not getting to us, you know, hidden from our our view. But yeah, this technology is incredible. This 
particular device, it's like a handheld device and it's been around about three years, but the company is taking off big. They've had like 8.5 million scans just since they opened the last three years. I think everybody's going to have this technology in their homes pretty soon. The, the word's getting out that you can um, restore your energy balance in your body and it's a good way to heal things. We've had testimonies about cancer, <laughs> tumors dissolving just by putting the right frequency on the body. It's incredible. Just this technology is just amazing. It's life changing, but yeah, I, I love it. <laughs> so how exactly does the bioresonance scanner work? Is it like because of your voice patterns, it tells you what to do. And if you do those things, it starts you down the way of healing. I mean, how does it all work out? Well, that's one of, it does a lot of things and it can be a little overwhelming when you try to explain the whole device, but I think the simplest way is you talk into it, it'll pick up the frequencies in your voice and then it, it knows exactly what frequencies you need to bring your body to an energetic state. So you'll have four audio files that'll get emailed to you. You listen to the audio files and what they do, they work on the brain and the nervous system and help calm you, help bring you back into balance. It's being investigated by the military, the police and firefighters for what it's doing to help PTSD. There's another section on the scanner where you just create a profile in the scanner, which is like a picture of yourself, your birthday, some other, your, your, your height, your weight. It can create an energetic profile of you and scan your whole body and send you a whole vitals report. So it'll tell you what's going on. Like if you're B, vitamin B deficient or if you have a virus going on, it'll tell you the name of the virus, the parasites that are in your system. If you have food allergies, it'll come up because everything in your body, if it's resonating at a right frequency, it'll the scanner can pick it up. And if it's out of balance, the scanner will tell you this is out of alignment. It is so crazy accurate too. It's better than having blood work done because it's actually scanning the frequencies in your blood as it's going through your body. You're not taking it out, putting it here. One of my doctor friends actually is one of the first people who bought one from me. And she said, you know, you can send your blood work off to three different labs and get three different results. She said, this thing is crazy accurate. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> she's like, <laughs> she's loving it. Like she uses it on the patients who don't have insurance tries to help people out with it. So do you feel like energy healing can work for everyone and does it work on pets as well? Yes, it, it does work on everyone. And it's, there's no harm that can come from energy. You can't, I mean, you can't harm anybody with this thing because it gives you gentle nudges of frequencies. I know there are bad energies out there, you know, like bad Wi-Fi and stuff like that out there, but this is all about giving good positive energies and bringing the body back to an energetic, healthy state. And you can use it on pets. Actually, my dog was limping a couple months ago. I didn't know what was wrong. I thought, oh, great. She was start limping too. I thought it was just a little sticker in her paw. And maybe she was just a little sore, but it wasn't. And I scanned her and it showed that she had like a ligament that was out of alignment. And I got worried because I saw the report. So I took her to the vet. And the vet's like, yeah, he said, well, we could give her some medicine, but it's not better in seven days. We might have to do um, surgery. And I'm like, oh, great. $300 to tell me the ligament, you know, something <laughs> with her hip. So I took her home um, and I started running frequencies to her from my scanner. And I said, we'll see if this helps her. The next morning, that dog came bounding out of her little kennel like nothing was wrong with her. She hasn't limped since then. Like, I can't believe I could have just ran frequencies to her. And just watched her and saw how she was doing. But I was scared, you know, just because dogs can't talk to you, but they don't have the placebo effect either. So I didn't tell her I was running frequencies on her. And the next day she was just fine. Um, and we've had all kinds of testimonies like that. A woman who has horses told us some crazy things about the horses she scanned and how crazy those vet bills can be with horses. <laughs> She's just so <laughs> thankful she can scan and see what's going on. Now we all have them. So what do you say? to the naysayers that says that this is hogwash, you're just taking up airspace. There's no way this works. They'll, they just have to look into the science. The science proves it. Einstein and Nikola Tesla told us that everything is energy and the future of medicine would be energy. And I think we're living in that time. We might not have the little scanners that go on Star Trek where you just beep them, but it's getting pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I know that you do do scans uh, for people. How can someone go about getting a healing um, a healing energy scan with you? 
If they go to my website at Lighthouse Energy Healing, I do offer a free inner voice scan, one for family. So if they reach out to me. I'd love to give them an inner voice scan and let them see how it works. I guarantee all their naysaying will go away. <laughs> Don't look at that. All their skepticism will disappear if they see their report because nobody can deny it when they look at it. They're like, oh, oh yeah, that has been bothering me. That's bothering me too. <laughs> so do you feel that energy healing is what helped you to heal from your past narcissistic relationship? Absolutely. There were, um, I used to shake, my left shoulder would shake when I would talk about when I was attacked one time during the marriage. And the first attorney I hired, he was a former police officer. And he said, you know, you have symptoms of PTSD. Every time you talk about that incident, your left shoulder is shaking. And I said, oh, I didn't know what that was. Well, right after that, I had done, was doing the emotion code session. I actually hired someone else to work on me. He's like, he didn't know anything about me. He did my session over the phone, like I do with my clients. And I was shocked. He's like, you have this emotion of panic, fear, dread, all of this, he said, in your left shoulder that's coming up. And he kept on coming up with all these emotions that were trapped in my shoulder. I'm like, I know what that's from. He goes, you don't have to tell me. He said, your body knows. It's all in your subconscious. Your body knows every emotion that's trapped in it that needs to be released. And I was just like, wow, I couldn't believe it. And he released it. Once he released it with intention, with the energy work, I didn't shake anymore. I still don't shake when I talk about it. And it it's almost like when I talk about it now, almost like it was happening to somebody else. It doesn't feel as painful as it used to, you know, when I would talk about it. Did you have to have any type of spiritual training to be able to do this? I took the classes, just the um, emotion code and body code. I got certified online through Discover Healing website. And I was diagnosed with um, neuropathy during my marriage. That's completely gone. So yeah, a lot of things just were gone for the emotion code. And then I discovered the the scanner. Now I use them together. It's amazing. Good stuff. We all need to learn about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I can tell that you're very passionate about this. Why are you so passionate about helping people to heal? You know, it brings me so much joy. I, I really found my, my thing. And, you know, as sad as I never really knew what I was supposed to do in life. And I hate it that I had to go through so much trauma as to get to here. But you know, though I say everything happens for a reason, I'm not saying that I called this or caused the abuse to happen, but I have truly found my passion. When I'm working with somebody and they're telling me that something's cleared up and they're just shocked, like, how did this happen? You know, I get so excited. I feel like it's happening to me and it brings me too much joy. I just, I don't want to do anything else. <laughs> I love it. Well, I'm glad you are because I've never heard of this before. And uh, I'm going to be sure, especially my wife who suffers from a lot of these things, uh, just from car accidents and stuff. I think everybody should check it out because I mean, I'm looking at you, you look totally amazing. Uh, and uh, from what I've read about it, yeah, this is something that we all need to look into. Uh, so from there, I know that you are in the process of writing a book. Do we know when that book's coming out and what is the book about? I think it'll be done in about six months. I'm, I'm just a perfectionist. I keep re-editing things and I got to just leave it alone. My husband's already published a book. He's like, you got to stop this or you're never going to get this published. Like, I know <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of about my journey through what I went through, but I'm going to keep it short. I want to focus more on the healing and telling people how they can avoid getting in those relationships and how they can heal if they're, if they've experienced it or been through it. I want people to know they can heal and also that they can not repeat it because a lot of people repeat the same mistakes I did. And I finally feel like I broke that, that cycle of abuse. I met an amazing man two years ago and got married and he's just, I did not know. I honestly didn't even know there were men out there like this. I did it. I just felt like they, that was just not real. <laughs> but after I did the healing work and started doing more self-love, energy is real. You start attracting more love. You start attracting that into your space. I think a lot of that comes from too. I don't know if your ex did this to you, but my mother was branded. She was always told by my dad that if she had a brand of his name on her shoulder, that no other man would want her. You know, there was abuse of like, no one's going to want you but me. You're ugly the whole nine yards. That is to break you so that you don't love yourself. So you can't experience what truly is out there for you. So that you've done the healing work and you start to love yourself. Now you're opened up to those high energies from people that wants to love you because now you can accept it. If you probably yeah. would have met your husband and you have now any other time than when you did, 
it may have passed you by because you don't know how to accept it or how to receive what he's trying to put out. So I do believe in that wholeheartedly. It's funny you say that sentence because that was the exact thing that was said to me before I married my ex. He said, you've already been divorced. You have a three-year-old child. Nobody else is going to want you. You should consider yourself fortunate that I want to marry you. And at the place I was in my life at that time, I believed him. I had a lot of low self-esteem. And, you know, you got to do the healing work. You have to love yourself or you're going to keep attracting those people that feed what you're putting out there. We get it back to us. <laughs> yes, they do. They do for sure. And the one thing I want to say to you to, to encourage you on this a little bit is I do know that it is painful to have to repeat your story. My mission this year is to go on as many shows as I can to talk about the abuse I've been through on my father's end and especially with the next, because a lot of us who are men, we have that. We've been through it, but we internalize it. And especially yeah. when you come from the black and brown communities, you know, we're told, oh, you got to be strong. You can't be crying, you know. Only weak men cry as much as it may hurt to recount that. Understand that we are helping people, you know, yes. just when you've been here today saying that you're helping some girl you don't know who say, oh, is that what I've been in? If she can get out, so can I. So the pain that you may feel by retelling it, just make sure you continue to understand that it is helping somebody. And because they heard you here today somebody else may be getting out of a narcissistic abusive relationship. You know, that's part of the reason on, on the emotion code. He says the reason we get trapped emotions is because we don't deal with them. And that's why they get trapped. We bottle them down. He said, men have a lot of those because it's why you exactly what you said. And, but they got to learn that it's okay. It's safe to have those emotions, feel that emotion, be with it and then release it in a healthy way. But we have to acknowledge them. I went through that too when my mother passed in 2020. You know, my youngest son, who still lives at home, was 13. He just broke down and lost it. And somebody said, Well, you, he shouldn't be crying like that. I'm like, Crying is a true emotion. If that's what he feels, he needs to express that. There's nothing wrong with the man crying. There's nothing wrong with the man giving another man who's his friend a hug. That's the problem is we want to put labels and titles and names on things. And then when we start dying, especially men at very young ages, you come to find out they have like 49 different illnesses that doctor's like, well, you know what? If he didn't have all this stress, so maybe if he'd have let this go, he probably could have saved himself. So it's not worth it to internalize it. So if you're a man out there and you need to cry, cry. That's what, that's an emotion God gave us. We need to use it. Yeah. I read a scientific paper about that. They've actually, that is a scientific study that's been done that crying is healing. It's actually your body's way of healing. You have to do that. I believe that because sometimes you just have a good, ugly cry. You feel better for the rest of the week. So <laughs> you know, just get it out <laughs> or go scream. <laughs> what do you want people to take away from you today about energy healing and getting out of bad relationships? I do want people to know that they're not alone. There are people out there speaking up, even though they've been, um, some of them are targeted, but there are people speaking up. There are groups out there you can get involved with to help support you. You're not alone and you can do this. Keep doing the inner healing work and love yourself enough to get out. You don't deserve it. Nobody deserves to live in that kind of life and toxic and, and in fear. Love yourself enough to do to get out. If somebody would like to get a hold of you to get some of this work done, let us know where they can get a hold of you at. You can look at Lighthouse Energy Healing on Instagram or on there's just a website or on Facebook. Please reach out to me. I'd be happy to talk to you and just see where we can go. Well, D, I thank you for being on the show today. It is totally enlightening. I've learned a lot. Uh, that's when I saw you. I got to have her on this show because I don't know anything about this. And if it's going to help people, uh, I want it to help. And I'm going to try this out myself because I, I never knew this worked. And maybe I can get rid of some stuff, too, in the process. <laughs> awesome. I love that. <laughs> well, thank you for coming on. It's been my honor, my pleasure to have you here. Anytime that you want to come back, feel free. I would love to have you back once your book comes out and release and I read it. And then we can have you come back and talk around that too. Well, if you'd like to do that. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, guys, that was the incredible D Hurley. You can find her at lighthouseenergy.com. Make sure you go over there, check her out. Go ahead and get that free scan that she's offering. It can't hurt. It can only help you to heal 
Everything that you do need to know about her will also be linked to her episode on my website at truecrimeandauthors.com. So please make sure that you go and support D and help her out with what she's trying to advocate for healing and for people that's in emotionally and abusive relationships. All right. So once again, thank you for joining us. I know you have many options for True Crime Podcast. I'm grateful that you have chose me. So I hope you guys are staying safe, being warm out there or chilly, whichever comment you live in. And be good to yourself and each other. And always remember, always stay humble. An act of kindness can make someone's day. A little love and compassion can go a long way. And remember that there is an extraordinary person in all of us. I'll catch you guys on the next one. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe. Join us on social media. One link to the link tree has it all. Feel free to drop us a line at truecrimeandauthors at gmail.com. Cover art and logo designed by Arslan. Sound mixing and editing by David McClam. Intro script by Sophie Wilde and David McClam. Theme music, Legendary, by New Alchemist. Introduction and ending credits by Jackie Voice. See you next time on True Crime, Authors, and Extraordinary People. 